All right, welcome to Speak for Yourself. I'm Jason Whitlock. That's my new co-host, Marcellus Wiley. Coming up, we'll look back at a crazy week one in the NFL. Plus, Plus we'll dive. We'll dive into the Serena Williams controversy. Can I get some time? <laughs> but we start with today's Whitlock. He's already jumping the gun. What you got today, Big <laughs> All right, last night, having suffered a knee injury, medics wheeled Rodgers into the Packers locker room early in the first half. Alfred Penny's, Pennyworth had to be waiting in the tunnel because when Rodgers reemerged, he was the Cape Crusader. He was vengeance in the Sunday night. He was the thing defenders fear. He was Batman. He rescued the Packers from a 20 to 0 deficit. He tossed three touchdown passes and led Green Bay to a 24 23 victory. He made Chicago Bear pass rusher Khalil Mack's first half rampage. Irrelevant. Mack destroyed the Packers and backup quarterback Deshaun Kaiser. Mack stripped Kaiser for a sack fumble and later intercepted him for a pick six. Mack was breathtaking in the first 30 minutes until the dark night rose from that Lambeau tunnel. My partner here tweeted, not even on the show yet, and I'm already right. Marcellus thinks Mr. Rogers proved that dude's narrative true. Defensive players aren't as valuable as offensive players, particularly quarterbacks. The Bears wasted $140 million paying Mac like a quarterback. Marcellus, you're dead wrong. You know what made The Dark Knight one of the greatest movies of all time, Marcellus? I'm listening. What you got? The Joker. Hmm. You know what made The Dark Knight Rises even better than The Dark Knight? What you got to say? What? Bang! Mm. Chicago should have won that football game. As good as Rodgers was, and he was Christian Bale good, it was the stupidity of the Bears' coaching staff that blew the game. The Bears had the ball late with a chance to put the game away on third and one deep inside Green Bay territory, and for some reason, they did this. Trissi looking to throw and does tip, and it's incomplete. Well, that worked out real well for Green Bay. They stop him, and the incomplete pass stops the clock. The Bears averaged 5.1 yards per carry. You don't throw the ball with Mitchell Trubisky when you're averaging more yards per rushing attempt than passing attempt. Yes, Trubisky averaged a pathetic 4.9 yards per pass attempt. This was insanity. That ridiculous play stole the game from Khalil Bain. The Bears settled for a field goal, and the rest is just standard Bears meltdown, including the dropped interception. Marcellus, hmm. the overwhelming feeling I had after the game is that the Packers were irresponsible for not doing everything in their power to acquire Khalil Mack. They let the Bears land Bane. They had a chance to give Batman his Robin and make the Packers a Super Bowl threat and favorite for the next four years. Did you get away with writing essays like that at Ball State? <laughs> I mean, did you? <laughs> How'd you Absolutely. graduate writing stuff like that? First of well, all... I graduated with a 2.2. But oh, OK, <laughs> now it makes sense. First of all, you got the wrong movie, and you doubled down and got the wrong superhero. You're talking about Bane when the Joker and Heath Ledger is the one that won the Oscar. That's the most memorable, right? Uh, 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 got I don't care about the Oscar. <laughs> okay. I know what I saw. Bane was better than the Joker. And, Go ahead. and you're going to tell me that The Dark Knight Rises was better than The Dark Knight? Are you kidding me? We we're talking about, we we're talking about a superhero that most people say is not even a superhero because he's actually a human with a belt. And you're trying to basically make the, the translation that Aaron Rodgers is a normal player and they're a super player somewhere out there in the universe. Explain yourself. What, I'm, what I just explained, Marcel, so maybe it was too uh, confusing, too uh, <laughs> uh, grammatically or just too literary for you. Okay. Aaron Rodgers is Batman. Mm. Batman needs a Robin in order to be great, or they would have never written Robin into the script. And so they had Robin right there in their grasp, the Oakland Raiders stupidly trading one of the best defensive players, perhaps of all time, and Aaron Rodgers partnered with Khalil Mack. Th that is an unstoppable duo, and they let it go. And you think somehow that game last night was proof that defensive pass rushers don't matter. Are you crazy? 
Khalil Mack won the game. The Bears coaching staff blew it. Okay, movie critic aside, let's get to the meat of this, this conversation. I think, I hope, you're conflating turnovers for sacks. You're making the, ins the, the, the example of sacks mean it all to a football team in terms of wins and losses. That's not where you get your greatest impact. You get it from turnovers. So here's some numbers, because obviously you're not hearing my words. Here's some numbers that will support my argument. And yes, I was right. Look at yesterday. I'm just going to use yesterday as an example yeah. of the top eight guys as sack artists. And if you look at the win-loss column, which was my point, you're going to see three wins, you're going to see three losses, and you're going to see two ties. What does that tell me? I'm going to pay a non-quarterback top quarterback money to get 500 results. What franchise, what executive committee is ever going to say, yeah, 20-plus million for 500 mayor results? Marcel, is the Broncos beat Russell Wilson and the Seahawks. Who do you think was responsible? Von Miller. Had a great game. Outlier. Keep going. You want to talk about T.J. Watt? You no, want to talk about no, last no, no. year? I, I, oh, oh, let the me top finish. two sack let, let artists? Me let me just finish. Ben Roethlisberger plays like absolute trash, mm -hmm. and the Steelers should have lost that game. Who kept a minute? T.J. Watt and others. T.J. Watt kept a minute, yep. a, a premier pass rusher. Miles Garrett on the other side, playing for the Cleveland Browns, who haven't who's lost every game for eternity, somehow they get a tie against one of the most talented teams in the league, and it's because Miles Garrett clowned and acted a fool. These defensive players matter. No, look, they matter. I understand. I played the position. I get it. But I've been there, as I showed you in, in that full screen, I've been there with a two-sack performance, three-sack performance you watch and witness, and then you look at the scoreboard, oh, we're down 20, we're down 30. It happened just last week, last year. The top two sack artists, Demarcus Lawrence, and we're talking about Chandler Jones in Arizona, the top sack artist. Not even in the playoffs. When you're talking about win-losses, we're talking about the quarterback position. Ball Carson in hand Palmer, every single play. Damn near 50 years old last year. <laughs> We just saw what, you know, a Dak performance last, uh, la yesterday that says something about the Cowboys offense. L look, Marcellus, I honest to goodness, you can't tell me as you watched that game last night and saw Khalil Mack single-handedly turn momentum with the, stra uh, the sack fumble uh, recovery and then with the pick six, he completely turned that game and the Bears had it. He was about to prove the entire narrative true that, uh, look, these great defensive players, particularly guys that can get to the quarterback, I I'm not saying they're the equal of a quarterback. They're not. But I'm not mad at all that this man is worth $140 million. He deserves that quarterback-type money. Von Miller just went out and took out Russell Wilson in Seattle. And Von Miller played well last year, and Denver didn't sniff the playoffs. Look, here's they the had thing. the wrong quarterback. Uh, 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 you're proving my point. Get the right quarterback, and it could minimize what you have on the defensive uh, line. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Whoa, whoa. Okay. okay. Let's stay in Denver. Yeah. Let's stay with Von Miller. Because you don't want to go on Camille no, no, no. Mack. No. And you don't want to go back and no, hit no, Oakland no. Raiders Let's just stay on and the Denver. bad defenses. Let's just stay on Denver. Who, who? Did Von Miller not just carry Peyton Manning to a Super Bowl title yes, and completely destroy the him opposition? And, uh, him and others, yes. And, and did, did, hold on. So you want to act genius on this subject, and I understand we're, right now I'm your adversary. I'm, I'm, you're not trying to support my argument. So let's go to someone else who is deemed a genius, Bill Belichick, who saw a young terror in Chandler Jones. And guess what Bill Belichick said to that same Chandler Jones? Adios. Peace out. And that's how the game goes. A guy like Chandler Jones now finds himself getting sacks, racking up sacks on an Arizona team that no one is saying is going to sniff the playoffs. Marcellus. I'm listening. Chandler Jones. <laughs> I'm listening. Is a guy that put up nice numbers. What do you mean nice? The nicest last year. I know. I get okay, it. the I get nicest. It. I get yep. It. Look, All right. look, I, I, in Kansas City, I saw a guy named... Eric, I hope you, if you're watching, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I saw a guy named Eric Hicks put up 14 sacks one season. Mm-hmm. That's a nice tip hat, nice season. But no one, he's not a major problem. It was a nice season. Chandler Jones, nice player. But when you start talking about Khalil Mack, Von Miller, J.J. Watt in his prime, uh, T.J. Watt looks like the second coming J.J. Right Watt now. in his prime, win, losses. You really want to go there? And it would be easy to tip your hat if you wore your fedora anymore. <laughs> I mean, where the fedora at, man? What happened? It'll be here, to, it'll be here tomorrow. Okay. It'll be here tomorrow. Okay, budget cuts, huh? <laughs> I mean, I get on the show all sudden. We no had fedora. to make room for you. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. You make this mistake as many fans make. Football is a game of skill. 
but it's a greater game of will. So when you want to add up superstar and superstar, Aaron Rodgers with Khalil Mack, oh my God, devastating. There's no way that's going to lose. Um, I've seen a dream team Eagles lose when they constructed a roster that no one else could be. I see Cincinnati every year roll out one of the most talented rosters. Dallas of yesteryear roll out the most talented rosters. And then you look up, can't even win a playoff game. So my argument is whether you have a star player on the D-line or not, that guy does not have the same impact as a quarterback who can go out there and have an average game and you can win versus a superstar historic effort from Khalil Mack and they're still on the short end of the stick. That's because of the coaching and the stupidity of the uh, Chicago Bears. Uh. I, I just want, I, honestly, and I know I'm moving off the defensive end, yeah. but I just yeah. want to say, how do you explain the whole Baltimore Ravens, Ray Lewis dynasty? How, how do you explain any of that? That for 15, 16, 17 years, Ray Lewis set a tone in Baltimore and made them a perennial threat to win their division and to win a Super Bowl. It's uh, like you don't respect the defensive side of the game uh, and, it's, and you falling for this trap. Uh, you falling that, for that all these the, traps, That I'm it's saying. the John Madden video era of football and, and, and you don't have to play any defense. Uh-oh, you don't fell into that trap. Now you're going to my era why I'm sitting up here ringless because I played against the Baltimore Ravens with a Ray Lewis. It was an entire team effort in which you can even ask Ray Lewis, hey, man, I had free roam playing the position in part because our defensive line was told two things. Yeah, get after the quarterback, but make sure those old linemen do not get to the second level. And you know that's how that, right. that defense was constructed. Don't try to change the argument. Don't move the goalposts. We're talking about up front, a Khalil Mack, a Peter Bowler of those days. Uh, uh, you uh, just Terrell, compare K Khalil Terrell, Mack to no, Peter Bowler. No, Peter Bowler had years. Terrell Suggs of today. Would you give Terrell Suggs, even though of, of he's, eight, he's in his thirties, man, and he's, he's still gotta, putting up numbers? My point is putting up numbers. The Von Miller and Khalil Mack and and, and some of these guys. They're special. There's a different layer agreed. than just putting up numbers. Agree. Well, Denver be special. Von Miller special. We've already seen him win a Super Bowl. Yeah, We've yeah. already seen the defensive side carry Peyton Manning at 100 years old to a Super Bowl. And do we pay franchise quarterbacks to say, hey, you won a Super Bowl, now the team could disappear out of the playoffs? Or do you pay a franchise quarterback to always consistently give me opportunities to be in the playoffs? You know the answer to that. There's no question about okay, it. Okay, so that's, that's the thing. You don't have the consistent impact playing up front. Everywhere Reggie White went, yeah, oh, yeah. they won. Oh, now you see, you, you, you think our viewers don't watch every show. On that same argument, I told you in the past when they were throwing the ball only 30 times, when it was three yards in a cloud of dust, yeah, you had maximum impact because of Reggie White, of Bruce Smith. Those guys were able to take advantage. But now we saw Andrew Luck throw the ball 53 times. You get you know three what, sacks. You know what, what about the other 50 you know passes? What Mar you know what, Marcel? I just think I I'm a former mid-major, medio mediocre offensive lineman. Mm. You were an elite NFL player, defensive side of the ball. I, I can't believe that as an offensive lineman, I'm trying to convince a defensive <laughs> yeah, right. player that y'all are just as valuable and that these guys that can get to the quarterback and disrupt the offensive game plan the way that is. I, I, it blows my mind. I'm, trying, I'm having okay. to convince you of that. I, I understand that, but I'm really about to blow your mind. Um, I need this answer because I know you've been hopping around. A lot, uh, lot of double dutch <laughs> going on over there. Um, <laughs> What has Denver done since they paid Von Miller? The floor is yours. You know what they did yesterday? <laughs> they beat Russell Wilson in Seattle, and they're undefeated right now. Oh, they're undefeated, one and oh. Hey guys, Jason McIntyre here. Before the show moves along, I wanted to tell you that support for the Speak for Yourself podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. They understand that home plays a big role in your life and family. That's why they created Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. Whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th, with Rocket Mortgage, you get a transparent online process that gives you the confidence to make an informed decision. It's convenient. Our trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. And in addition to getting a real mortgage approval in minutes, you can even adjust the rate and length of your loan in real time to make sure you're getting the right solution for you. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply. Understand fully. 
mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash speak. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states. NMLSconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. All right, welcome back. Marcellus and I are joined now by a couple of NFL legends, Rod Woodson and Tony Gonzalez. Time for the big story. Let's move to Cleveland, where the Steelers didn't miss Le'Veon Bell, but probably wish Big Ben hadn't shown up. After the quarterback turned the ball over five times and blew a 14-point lead in the fourth quarter, to tie the Browns. But they weren't the only team with high expectations that struggled yesterday, with Dak Prescott getting sacked six times and the Cowboys offense putting up just eight points in an ugly loss to the Panthers. All right, we got two historic franchises, one with a great quarterback that's supposed to be a legend, maybe a Hall of Famer, other with a young guy. I'm more concerned with Ben Roethlisberger. Mm. Five turnovers, picking up right where he left off last year, just mistake-ridden. And we heard all this hype about Big Ben's in the best shape of his life. And, you know, he needs some therapy because I think it's between his ears right now. <laughs> Who cares about him being in shape? Does he know where to go with the football? I don't think so. And, and I, I look at that Pittsburgh team, and, and Mike Tom is going to justifiably take some heat. But, but I'm starting to believe Big Ben is more of a problem in Pittsburgh than anybody. No, I'm not going there. Uh, look, if you look at Dak Prescott and you look at his Dallas Cowboys roster and construction, not enough talent on the perimeter to really help out that running game and to help out Dak Prescott in his second year. So, with uh, Ben Roethlisberger, I just think mentally, as a coach, vet rules. Like, you know what? He's going to return to the mean, which is he's going to return to being good, if not great. But you look at Dak Prescott – there's not enough on the resume where you can really, truly believe that greatness is in front of him. He hit the ground running. I get it. When Romo got hurt in that preseason and they didn't alter the offense and he had the strong offensive line and Travis Frederick and others were all playing at a top level, of course, Ezekiel was able to see the safety out the box and they were able to have play action pass. You had Dez Bryant, Jason Witten, all that worked. But now no Dez, no Witten, no Frederick. Offensive line's not the same, shifting guys in different positions, and no one on the outside to push that safety back. I think that Dak Prescott, he's going to look at the next year or so and realize he is now in the NFL. Yeah, you know, I look at it and, you know, listen, when Ben in September, especially on the road since 2015, 27 touchdowns, 26 interceptions. So on the road, especially in September, they don't start fast. They haven't played well the last several years. I think, listen, you got Juju. Mm -hmm. You got arguably the best re other receiver in the National Football League in AB. All right. You got a nice running game. The defense is coming around. I don't have a real problem with Ben. I know Ben needs to take care of the football. He has to be smarter with the football. At the end of the day, you look at Dak. And the guy, you got to think, okay, when you said the outside weapons for the Dallas Cowboys, who are they? Suspect. Thompson, Hearns, Williams, Beasley. Mm -hmm. Defense coordinator going to see that. They're going to say, I'm putting all my 11 guys in the box. <laughs> right, right. All 11 guys are going to be in the box. Prescott, you have to beat this on a consistent basis. I'm more concerned about that offense than the Pittsburgh Steelers. Absolutely. I agree with you. I, look, I don't put much stock in the first game of the season. Come on. It was raining out there. They went against a pretty good Cleveland defense, too. Let's not discount that. A couple of those balls bounced off guys' hands, yada, yada, yada. I think they're going to be okay. It's one of the most successful franchises for a reason. They're going to get it together, and they're going to figure this out. They got too much talent not to. Looking at the other side, Dak Prescott, I'm telling you right now, first of all, we have never seen him – play at where, where, what he's capable of doing because he had all those weapons. I'm con this is when adversity is striking. We all went through it as players. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen sooner or later. It's happening for him right now. He no longer has those other guys to lean on. We're going to see what he's made of this year. This is a big year for him contract-wise. You guys know about his, his – he was drafted after the fourth mm -hmm. round. He's playing for a contract this year. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, for, I'm excited to see what he can do this year, but – I don't know. I don't know what to expect, I guess, but I'm way more concerned about him. I just want to introduce some facts into this conversation I think everyone's trying to avoid. Facts. <laughs> Cleveland hasn't won a football game since Tony was in the league. So one team is playing the Cleveland <laughs> Brown. They won one. The, oh, they, they won, won one. one. Don't do that. The Cleveland Brown. Don't do that. When was that? 96? <laughs> so the Cleveland Browns. And, and, and one guy is supposed to be a legend headed to the Hall of Fame, and the expectations are they're supposed to compete for a Super Bowl. And we saw Big Ben last year. 
with this kind of trash performance on the road with the turnovers, blaming coaches, and I'm just doing what they told me on the side. Remember the interception close to the goal line, the goal line that cost in the game? Oh, yeah. Big Ben has been – and they, oh, I'm thinking about retiring. Oh, no, I'm mad that they drafted Mason Rudolph. Big Ben, to me, is a lot of the immaturity, and my expectations for Big Ben are just higher than for, for Dak Prescott. So when I start talking about concern, and you have Antonio Brown, you have Juju, you, you have James Conner filling in and doing a nice job, you have an offensive line that's all in and committed, you have all that continuity, and you come out against the Cleveland Browns with five turnovers, and I'm supposed to be – as y'all said, Dak's working with damn near me out there, wide receiver. Yeah. And I'm concerned about Big Ben. He's got all the tools. Yeah, but, but you're stating the obvious, and that's not profound to sit there and say, you know what? Expectations are different for Roethlisberger than they are with Dak Prescott. We all get that. But the reality is, if you look at Ben Roethlisberger, he has assets around him that could pick him up even if he struggles, which, going to your point, last year he struggled. Remember that Jacksonville game? Five yeah. interceptions. And this is the same year where they win 12 ball games with ben, Big, Big Ben starting. And it's the same year where they go into playoffs and Big Ben had a great game, but they still lost that game because neither defense could really show up. The point of it is he's picked himself up from this position before. Show me on record when Dak Prescott has. And you, you go back, and I, I'm listening to what Tony told First game of the year. And go back to the last several years for the Pittsburgh Steelers early in the season. They just haven't played well. They're, they're, they're not on stride yet. And at the end of the day, I, I want to see Ben take care of the football. Everybody wants to see Ben take care of the football. But at the end of the day, you think, okay, Prescott, what does he have to work with? Great quarterbacks make great plays. And we have seen Ben make great plays in the past. We know it's in him. We know that he can accomplish great things there. But you got to say, okay, can Dak, can, can Dak be that guy? Can he make these receivers better? We know Ben, we know Ben can make some plays. Mm -hmm. Big time. He, he's going to make big time plays. My question is, can Prescott be that guy to make his offense better without the running game? Yeah, I, I just don't see it happening. But look at the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> they're, they're a reality television show. <laughs> they're so emotional all the time. Mike Tom is <laughs> emotional. You got people saying, I want to retire. You got people, AB, you got Le Le Le'Veon Bell tweeting with the emoji and the, all that stuff. It, it's how it always is with this team. But in the end, reality television sells, especially in America. That's not, but that's, but this, that's, that's they're going to get it right. That's not how. The Pittsburgh Steelers operate. Okay, now we okay. talk about put that jersey back on. Get them, brother. They're not emotional. They're not emotional. Yes, they are. He wore okay. that jersey. Let's, talk about let's, it. Let's just say this: the, it's the one of the best ran organizations in the National Football League for a reason. They have won. They've only had three head coaches for a reason. Stability. All yeah. right. It's stability. It's doing things the right way. Okay. Social media. These guys are different. All right. You go in that locker room. You know these guys are not like we were when we played. So they understand. Listen, that little phone, those emojis and all that, those guys get it. Mm -hmm. Guys get over emotional. They drafted guys when I was there. I didn't get them. I didn't say, hey, this guy's going to take my spot. Ben can't worry about who they draft. He has to worry about his job. All the players have to worry about their job. AP, even though he's done silly things in the past with his emojis and his little things on, on social media, he still shows up. He's a pro's pro. He wants to be great. He is great. Okay, Le'Veon Bell, he's not going to be there this year. He's not going to be – he's, no, he's going to be there probably week 10, after week 10, yeah. so he can get his money and he can season. get his accrued season right. so he can go somewhere else. But at the end of the day, the Pittsburgh Steelers will win and Mike Tomlin's going to have a good pro product on the field. Yeah, I agree with all those points except the whole – back in my day, we were different than these guys today in the social media. All it is is exposure. Like, from my era, 97, 06, 07. It was some knuckleheads on that team. It was some knuckleheads on the field. It was oh, knuckleheads, it was knuckleheads. On the field. And all it is, social media is just exposing what the reality is. So the reality is still the same. All around the world, same song. But now we're in the point where we're starting to record that. I, I just feel like y'all missing the, the whole point. And to me, the, the biggest knucklehead in that locker room might be Ben Wasserberger. He, he cleaned up his <laughs> off-the-field deal that he had, you know, with women. Okay. But I'm not sure if he's cleaned it up inside the locker room and with how he conducts himself with his team. Again, when I look at the whining about drafting Mason Rudolph, when I, oh, I'm thinking about retiring and all that stuff, this reality show, he's the diva of the reality show. And again, we keep pointing at AB with the Facebook Live. We want to point at Le'Veon, he's in a contract holdout. We want to point at Tomlin, he's the head coach. 
Trust, and Big Ben is my favorite football player. He played in the MAC. He plays like John Elway, my favorite player of all time. He might be the problem. All right, welcome back. Tony Gonzalez is back with us. We're joined now by Michael Vick. Let's move to a guy who had a big week one, Patrick Mahomes, who made Andy Reid look really smart yesterday, showing off his rocket arm and throwing for four touchdowns in a big road win over the Chargers. Meanwhile, last season's breakout quarterback Deshaun Watson struggled through his return from injury yesterday, turning the ball over a couple of times in a loss to the Patriots. Even still, I'm a bit higher on Deshaun Watson than Mahomes. There's a bigger body of work with Deshaun Watson. Uh, I do think Mahomes looked awesome. You know, I watched that game. I'm a Chiefs fan. But if I had to bet on who's going to come back, I just think Mahomes is going to throw some interceptions. I think he's a risk taker. The long bet, the long play, I think, is on Deshaun Watson. I think he has a b bit of a brighter future. Well, you got a bigger body of work with Deshaun, obviously, the eight games now. Uh, but you don't have a big body of work from Deshaun Watson. That's why I'm going with Patrick Mahomes. You're talking about one guy who has eight games and one guy who has one game. And in that one game, by passer rating, he had a better game than all of Deshaun Watson's eight games. Think about that. And just 127 passer rating, find a game where Deshaun Watson had that. He didn't last year. So that already is a win in the column for Patrick Mahomes. But I was at the game. Mike, you was at the game, I too, was at right? the game. And we gonna, obviously, I'm going to make this quick because Mike Vick, former quarterback, Andy <laughs> Reid, I'm going to let him talk. But when you play against the Andy Reid system, and as complicated it is on the perimeter especially, and you talk about the weapons he has, and probably the best weapon in football right now, Tyreek Hill, and that arm strength. Uh, I, I measure arm strength not just by distance travel, but by trajectory. And, and does it get there? And Mike Vick's ball got there. I saw yesterday with my eyes a special talent, a special arm, and a special offense. Yeah, and that was one of the reasons I wanted to go to the game to see it live. I seen it in practice, but obviously and yesterday, Tony, we seen it in, in some practice film that Peter showed us. And you want to see it in a live game. Obviously, I think he picked up where he left off last year. I think the ceiling is really high for this guy, in part because he has Andy Reid, who's really creative, innovative, and he's always going to keep the defense guessing. As long as Patrick can adapt to the system and what they're doing and, and get better each and every week, it, it's going to be You take Mahomes a, over Watson. I take Mahomes over Watson. I, I mean, I only say that because it just seems like he picked up from where he left off last year. It, Deshaun, it seems like he took a step back yesterday. Mm. And, look, I know it's just game one. It was week Played one. against Belichick. It was a new, against yeah. New England, so I have to give him credit for that. But, uh, you know, for the most part, for the things that I've seen Patrick Mahomes do, I don't know if it can be duplicated. I, you know, I think that's a huge thing. Bill Belichick is a genius. I've yeah. had some of my best games ever as a pro against the New England Patriots, and I've had my worst games yeah. as a New England <laughs> Patriots. Same here. One catch, 13 yards. Same here. One of the worst games I ever played was against Bill Belichick. Yeah. So this, this, this guy is good. He knew he's had a whole offseason preparing for Deshaun Watson, and he went in there and gave it to him. Yeah, uh, if I look at these guys, though, it, this is a hard question because I, I really like both these guys. Right. And, and it's like you like a Lamborghini or you like a Ferrari. Do you like pizza or do you like lasagna? Which one is your favorite? I got answers hey, you to can't both. Lose. <laughs> you, can't, you can't lose. Which you, you, pizza? Can't, you can't lose. You can't lose. Well, <laughs> but the point is, I, I'm, I, it, it, you know, I can close my eyes and pick one of these guys because I think these guys are truly the future of the NFL. They're going to be special, special yeah. players. But Mahomes, if I have to pick one, because that's what we're doing here on the show, I'm going to go with Mahomes just because of the weapons. Andy Reid is a big part of that. Yeah. He is a genius. He's going to put him in great positions to be successful. And he's got the weapons. He's got what, the best receiving Tyree tight end. Hill. In the league, and Travis Kelsey, Tyree Kill, Sammy White. I mean, it, the backfield, he's going to have a lot of success. They're going to lead the league in scoring this year. Houston has DeAndre Hop Hopkins. They, Bill O'Brien is supposed to be a he's quarterback great. guru. Yeah. Right. He, he's got some pieces in place. This is an interesting thing for me. It came up because uh, the, the Chiefs two years ago went up in the draft to get Patrick Mahomes, and Deshaun Watson was still there. He got taken two picks later. As a Chiefs fan, people were sitting around like, man, we should have taken Deshaun. And then I, I think people are being a little bit a prisoner of the moment. Bosa didn't play. San right. Diego didn't heat them up the way he's going to get heated up, I think, in some games. And my, he's a risk taker. He's got that Brett Favre type deal that's going to lead to, I think, a lot of interceptions. 
But I, I just I don't know if you could have got off to a better start than that. Here's the one thing. When Andy Reid walks in a room and tells you you're good, it makes you feel great. You know you're in a great position. When Bill O'Brien walks in the room, you say, oh, okay, you work with Tom Brady, so <laughs> I believe in what you're saying. Right, right. But it's not the same impact. And look, let me hit you with a Wileyism. Yep. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt said, comparison is the thief of joy. You know why? Because right now, I want to enjoy both of these quarterbacks, <laughs> but at the same time, to not rip my suit being on the fence, I'm going to say Patrick Mahomes. What I saw from him, few guys already have that type of moxie and that skill set in their second year. And I think in year two, just the comfort level is supposed to go up, and Deshaun should have showed that yesterday. All right, to yesterday's biggest surprise, Ryan Fitzpatrick, who rose from the quarterback dead, to stun the Saints with a 400-yard, four-touchdown performance, a lot of people were writing off the Bucs without Jameis Winston. He suspended for the first three games. But now people are actually saying Fitz Magic could steal the <laughs> starting job from Jameis. Uh, I'm, <laughs> Patrick, he's 35 years old. Yeah. And I've seen him get hot for a minute. Mm -hmm. And I've seen him turn very cold. I... I, I Jameis Winston is a knucklehead, but he's got so much talent. He's a student of the game. I think their ceiling is higher with Jameis. I think Ryan Fitzpatrick, I don't care how hot he starts, at some point he's going to crash back down to earth, and you're better off with Jameis at quarterback than you are Ryan Fitzpatrick. Oh, first of all, respect to Fitz Magic, Harvard, Ivy League in the house, still doing it at 35 <laughs> years young. Um, the writing is not on the wall, but the, the spray paint is in hand. And they're about to tag this wall up, said, Jameis, you are not the face of a franchise in terms of leadership and character. And because of a subpar year last year, and these issues continue to come into play, we're starting to look, snipers in the bushes, we're starting to look for reasons to get you out of that position. And... Veteran players like us have seen it before where if you look at a guy like Ryan Fitzpatrick, he's not the future for you, but he certainly could be the stopgap. He could be the present placeholder until you Win find... Win-noun guy. Win-noun Win guy and find that guy. I think Jameis Winston's in a position where if Fitzpatrick keeps playing well in the next two games, Eagles, Steelers, and Jameis comes back and he's like, my turn, that may have been the straw that breaks the camel back. The three games Fitzpatrick plays well, assuming he does, and Jameson, your issues before, I think they say, let's just ride this out with Fitz Magic and see where it goes. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily agree. First of all, I take my hat off to Ryan Fitzpatrick for the body of work yesterday. I mean, if he can do that for the next two games, then I think the Bucs will be in a good position. But this is Jameis Winston's team. They picked up his option for a reason. Of course, he had the offseason mishap. But I think it's his responsibility to show this franchise that he has the ability to take them where they want them to go. Or the reason they drafted him was because they know he has the talent. It showed in the preseason. Mm -hmm. He had a great preseason. It looked like he matured. I talked to him a couple of times. And he sounds like a different person. He sounds like a different man. So I think it's his responsibility now to show the world that he can take this team to the playoffs so they can look forward to keeping him and, and retaining him in the future. Yeah, well... I, the way I look at this, if but well, I'm asking you, I'm gonna turn the question. If he plays like this for the next two games, hey. that's where you have to ask yourself, do you put him back in there? Right. Jameis Winston, he's had some problems. This isn't the first little hiccup yeah. that he's had. He's shown some questionable behavior on the sideline in the games, just a little antics, stuff that he, you know, when he was doing the W and eating the, yeah, yeah. like it, it was weird. <laughs> Stuff's a little weird. Very Stuff's weird. a little weird, and <laughs> it makes it me question him, <laughs> and because he's got this huge amount of talent, and when people talk to him, they all say the same thing you say. Yeah. Oh, he says the right thing. He's a leader. He's going to be great. Uh, if, if Fitzpatrick plays like this, in my book, you got to keep him in there. If Thank he does this again, that's this what is they gonna do. Be tough though. Well, uh, here's what I'll say: If I'm the Buccaneers. And if anything that's been true about, said about Winston is true, I think he's going to grow from this experience. Getting humbled is going to make him a better leader. This may be a blessing in disguise for Jameis mm -hmm. if they perform well without him. I, I, I th I'm just telling you, if I'm the, we, we, he's, Ryan Fitzpatrick's 35. We've seen him get money to be people's quarterback and it all blow up in their face. When he's playing with house money, I think he's great. When he's the guy, 
I think he gets exposed. That's been in his DNA. That's his NFL mm -hmm. resume. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, 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 that's why I, Jameis Winston was put at the top of the draft for a reason. He won the Heisman Trophy, a national championship for a reason. He's done some really dumb things off the field. But we got to remember in this last instance, that was actually something that happened in 2016. Good point. Yeah. Jameis Winston is a student of the game, can play the game. He wants to be great. I think he's, he's going to move past his immaturity. Careful. We need to distill this argument to wins, losses, production. Because we know his character issues. And uh, you can mature. You cannot mature from those situations. Only time will tell that. Here's the thing about him, the player. Came in first year, 6 and 10. And had a good year. Then he didn't have as good a year, but they win nine games. Then last year, the team only won three games, and he had his worst year. Start to add that up. And they're starting to say, wait a minute, a rocky road. We're on this roller coaster with this guy on the field. And you're going to couple that with rocky road, if not worse, off the field? That's when it becomes concern as the face of a franchise. All right, welcome back. Marcellus and I, let's move to a huge story outside the NFL this weekend. Serena Williams, who not only lost in the U.S. Open final to Naomi Osaka on Saturday, but also got fined $17,000 for a verbal altercation with the chair umpire, Carlos Ramos, over his decision to dock Serena a game for repeated code violations. Take a listen. Are you kidding me? Because I said you're a thief. Because you stole a point from me. But I'm not a cheater. But why? But you and I told you to apologize to me. But you know how many other men? You know how many other men do things that are? I, I don't think they do much worse than that. This is not fair. There's a lot of men out here that have said a lot of things because they're a man. That doesn't happen to them. A number of people came to Serena's defense after the incident including Andy Roddick, who tweeted, quote, so I'll only comment on the sport that I played professionally for 13 years. I've said worse and never got a penalty in my entire career. I don't care how long he's been a referee. Mistakes happen, and I believe he made one. Serena certainly wasn't perfect either. Serena doubled down on the double standard theme during her post-match press conference. I've seen other men call other umpires several things, and... I'm here fighting for women's rights and for women's equality and for all kinds of stuff. And for me to say thief and for him to take a game, it made me feel like it was a sexist remark. I mean, like, how uh, he's never took a game from a man because they said thief. <laughs> for me, it blows my mind. I just feel like the fact that I have to go through this is just an example for the next person that has emotions and that want to express themselves and they want to be a strong woman and they're going to be allowed to do that because of today. Maybe it didn't work out for me, but it's going to work out for the next person. A lot, a lot to unpack here, <laughs> Marcellus. Yeah. I, I think there's enough blame to go around for everybody. I, I think that, you know, I always say about officials, particularly in the biggest games, let the people on the court decide it. Don't no one's there to see the chair umpire right. or the referee in basketball, and so I, I agree with the people that say Carlos Ramos overreacted and did too much. I also agree with the people though that say there's a way to handle adversity, and Serena didn't handle it well, and created an international incident and something that overshadowed this young woman uh, from Japan at 20 years old, winning her first major. Uh, that Serena's handling of the umpire overshadowed a great moment and a great victory. Serena was getting beat. She got beat in the first set, got her, her butt whipped pretty good. And I think that frustration just blew up into an incident. And I see blame on both sides. Uh, but I'll stop there and continue. Yeah, tons of layers to this story right here. Um, as you said, the blame pie, uh, everybody getting a piece, you yeah. know, in that respect. Uh, the moment of altercation with an official is not necessarily the time to have the trial, you know, in that moment. Uh, we could apply that to other facets of life as well. But um, the thing that I do support with Serena and what she was saying is she was trying to make a distinction between being graded on standard or being graded on a curve. Because if she's looking at it like, there's a double standard here because if we're just saying, hey, 
No one talks to the officials. That's man and woman. If we're saying, hey, you can talk to the officials and you can have energy, passion, uh, you can go there on an official, then if that's the standard, what did I do wrong? But if you're grading it on a curve, which is like, oh, men get away with certain things, and we saw it exampled in the clothing change where a, a point's assessed as penalty to a woman who's making a clothing change, but to a man, he's not assessed the same penalty. So I understand where she's coming from. The hypocrisy had boiled over to her to the point where she wanted to take issue. I, I, I get it, but I also think it's a, a know your personnel. Mm. If you're a student of the game, Preach. Uh, Carlos Ramos's reputation is well documented. I'm not a tennis expert. No. I'm someone that watches Serena Williams matches and ignores the rest of tennis. Mm. And I think a lot of people uh, discussing this are just like me. We watch tennis when Serena's playing yeah. and we ignore the rest of tennis. And so I think a lot of our opinions are ill-informed. And, and so, and then when I see people, are they actually doing the homework and the research? This referee, this umpire's reputation, well-established with men. Rafael Nadal, quoted a couple years ago, feeling like this ref or this umpire had it in for him yes. and has picked on him. Quoted New York Times everywhere talking about this particular umpire. This particular umpire is, he's got a quick whistle or, you know, he will penalize you more quickly than any place else. And so where, where I blame uh, Serena is like, well, you got the first warning and that was the inappropriate warning for the coaching. Right. Every, you know, everybody, the coaching warning he made was doing too much. But it's like when a referee gives you a bad technical in an NBA game and you know, well, now I got to be real extra careful because if I get a second one, I'm tossed out of the game. So once you got the bad technical, yellow card, foul, whatever, mm -hmm. you can't break your racket. Right. Because you can't slam your racket and break your racket yep. because the ref now, based on the rules, has no choice but to assess a second penalty and that a second penalty is the loss of a point and all that. And so she had, again, to me, this is Draymond Green. This is Charles Barkley. This is a player that's a bit too emotional. And, 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 and I just want to be clear here in terms of, of there's plenty of players, Nadal, from McEnroe to everybody, they've all been, if you're an emotional player, these umpires get after you. It's not just a man thing. And so I sometimes think we overlook incompetence and mm. go straight to personal attack. Mm. Oh, my God, th that person wasn't incompetent. They attacked me because I'm a woman or because I'm black or because I'm Latino. Sometimes it's just incompetence. Okay, I, I get that. Look, not all the time is race or gender motivation yeah. for your actions. But all the times it's considered when it's talking about penalty and punishment. Because if you look at it, the race, the race issue here I think is minimal. I think that's a stretch to a large degree. But the gender issue, I think she has a valid and correct point in. If I see, if I go to the courts and I'm watching the, the male counterparts go out there and perform, and they're getting away with everything. I mean, left side, right side of their mouth, it doesn't matter. As long as they come out your mouth, it's fine. And then I go the, to that same place, and then all of a sudden, the penalty, the, all of a sudden, the punishment, that's when the race and gender comes into play, especially the gender place. So I'm looking at it like you said it, emotion. We all try to contain it, but the emotional context of any match, especially the U.S. Open, good luck trying to contain that because you feel like everything's on the line, especially as you're trying to break the most majors won. So this mounting pressure and the comeback, everything. I just look at Serena in that moment, and she's going to have some regret because she's going to say, I just got upset and over-emotional facing a 20-year-old who was already putting it on me. Like, that's what's gotten lost. Serena, Serena lost 6'2", six, 6'4". Six, Serena didn't lose 7'5". Like, it wasn't close, and she made it worse. She was doing well in the second set, I think, up 3-1 yep. when things went sideways. I I'll say this. Serena is arguing that she's fighting for women's rights and that part of her stance here is so that women get treated like men. Martina Navratilova wrote a very good piece for the New York Times today 
that I thought made a great point, and it's a point that I ask people all the time. Who, what, are, what are we really fighting for? Are, are we fighting so that we can make all the mistakes and do all the bad things others do? And if that's the case, is that really a fight worth having? And so Martina's point was like, it's, it's like when your kids get in trouble and they say, well, Jimmy and them, they smoke weed. You just caught me with a beer. And it's the point all over to every other kid and blah, blah, blah. Every other kid's doing this. That's something that you're supposed to grow out of by the time you're in your late 30s and you're a parent. And, and so this whole thing of, oh, well, McEnroe and Jimmy Connors and this guy and that guy did it. And, and so I'm not, and this is where I get crossways with a lot of people about my point of view. And, and this will be a harsh statement. I'm not fighting to do the bad things white guys do. That's not my fight in life. I, I'm actually fighting to represent my family and the people I care about and to represent, quite honestly, God in a way that brings honor to my family and the church that I grew up in. And I've made a lot of mistakes, a lot of public mistakes. But I'm, I'm willing to claim them, own them, and not sit there and say, well, so-and-so got to do this and so-and-so got to do that. Why can't I do it? When you make a mistake, own it. Yeah, uh, let's get nuanced, because I like the fact that you brought that layer up. Um, I took exception what Martina Navratilova said, because in, 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 in totality, she's internalized the discrimination against the women in the sport. Like, she's accepted it to a point where she says, well, they get away with it, but why would we want to get away with the same thing? And you could take that to other facets of life and say, ooh, that's not a good place to be. I respect what you're saying. Like, I don't want to be as bad as someone on the other side in terms of race or in gender, because I don't want to play down to my lower self. Yeah. But it, one level of equality and fairness is, if I do play down to that level, am I being harshly punished? or justly punished. Serena is saying, I wasn't justly punished. Because the men do the same thing, and man after man in the tennis world has tweeted that we get away with it. I, I agree, but man after man after man isn't the greatest player of all time, like Serena is. True, different Man standard. after man after man doesn't have the history of demonstrative behavior that Serena does. The only person I would maybe analogize her to, and I don't think she's as far as McEnroe was, but, but again, it's just like when I say people aren't really doing the homework and people are jumping in brand new to this topic, because again, I'm not a tennis expert, but I, I spent the past two days just like researching, <laughs> right, trying exactly. to get some context. In 1981, John McEnroe won Wimbledon. And when you win Wimbledon, they make you an honorary member, member of the Wimbledon Lawn Club and Croquette Club. Okay. They publicly announced, we're not putting you in because your behavior brings disrepute to tennis. Mm. And so they wouldn't let him in the All England Lawn Club because they felt like his behavior was so bad, so tough, they didn't want to be associated with it. That's a white man they did that to. And so for anybody that's got revisionist history that John McEnroe didn't pay a price for being over the top and all the history, it's just wrong and inappropriate. And so just imagine if Wimbledon had done that to Serena. Mm. And they just, ha people's heads would melt and explode and we'd have a civil war. And so I, I, just, I just think when you're the greatest player of all time, you sit on that throne, there's a higher expectation. You, there's some things you have to carry, and particularly when you get to age 35, 36 like Serena, and you're a mom, and you're a wife, and things like that, I just don't want her, I don't want the fight to be, I want to act as bad as John McEnroe or some of these guys. I, I, I want the fight to be, I, I'm going to leave you all with no doubt. Not only am I the greatest player, I'm the greatest person you've ever seen in this sport. Oh, you want to Frankenstein an athlete, which is so <laughs> difficult because her gift at times is her curse. I mean, that's what makes the greats great. You have to go to a place that is of psychosis, Kobe, Jordan. Like, they go to weird places, and we don't get it because we're not there. But where they are creates greatness. Marcellus, I'm a person that went to some real nutty places and had to learn some real hard lessons. Yes, yes. Because I was a nut.
at some point, you got to grow up. Welcome back. I'm Jason Whitlock. That's my new co-host, Marcellus Wiley. Let's return to the NFL, where Jimmy Garoppolo struggled against the vaunted Vikings defense yesterday, completing just 45% of his passes and throwing three interceptions in his first career loss as a starter. Afterwards, Viking defensive lineman Daniil Hunter explained the key to shutting down Jimmy G-String. As the game goes on, you have to bring the pressure on him. You see that he's starting to get scared. Wow. That's a mm. powerful statement from Denise. Pop, pop. <laughs> shot That's fire. a shot. Uh, and it's a deserved shot. Oh, I, 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 I say that as a Jimmy G fan, but I watched this entire game. Okay. Three interceptions, could have been a couple of more. Uh, late in the game, had a tight end, open in the end zone, overthrew him. It was a bad g a game against a great defense. But I, I left that game a little concerned about not nearly as accurate with the football as I expected. Uh, a little concerned. Like, like we're, we're talking about who had a, a quarterback who had a perfect record. Uh, a, a quarterback who had no flaws that we could actually put on his game to, to this point of what we saw yesterday. And let's see what we saw yesterday. What we saw was a Vikings defense being the Vikings defense, who waited eight, nine months, watched film of Jimmy G, finally said, we see this coming. We had an offseason to breathe on this guy. We're the number one scoring defense. We're the number one in yards uh, game allowed defense. And then you see a quarterback come in who doesn't have two of his offensive linemen, no Marquis, right, hurt. Right, hurt. No Marquis Goodwin. No Jarek McKinnon. Hurt. And it's like, load up on Jimmy G. And now let's make him imperfect. So I understand he took a step back, but he's taking a step back from perfection. Jimmy G is amazing in terms of skill set and talent. Still had one of those all-time throws, the little scramble, roll out left and dart. But we're not going to talk about the two touchdowns that were dropped. We're not going to talk about the huge long gain by the tight end that was dropped. Uh, Jimmy G had a game that he's not going to repeat too often, but it was certainly a step back from his perfect days. I, I love your points about they lost two offensive linemen during the game. They lost Marquise Goodwin early in the game. Yeah. That will shake up and rattle any team. He certainly had some balls dropped that just blew my mind. But the thing that I my expectations for Jimmy G are accuracy. Yeah. Ball out on time and accurate. That's what I didn't see. He got shook. And, and I, I just didn't think of Jimmy G as a guy that could get shook. If you're willing to go out in Beverly Hills and paparazzi headquarters <laughs> with a porn star, you're not a guy that can get shook very often. No. That, that, that scares a lot of guys. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> well, just, <laughs> right. Just keep it on your phone, huh? <laughs> <laughs> like, We're going to go out later. <laughs> Once yeah. everybody gone. I get it. Look. You're right. I think his mental makeup is this is just going to be a blip on the radar. This is not the normal Jimmy G. We have seen greatness. We have seen uh, positive things from Jimmy G. What's going to happen is Jimmy G is going to realize, oh, that's how you deal with a pass rush. Oh, that's how you deal with a vaunted defense. Oh, that's how you deal with the fact that there are, there's a porous offensive line in front of me. I don't have the assets around you. The best part about football as a player, not just the coaching, not just the support, not just the film study, is the ability within four quarters to self-correct. And what you're going to see from a young Jimmy G as a starter in the NFL is his ability to self-correct. Now I have to step into that throw because I saw him throw an interception yesterday. Simple mechanics. Didn't want to step into it, take it on the chin, so you, you half it, and then what happens? Interception the other way. You learn to correct those mistakes either within the game or from game to game. What I hope is true is that they played really terribly and still had a chance to win. One possession. It's a hell of a Vikings team. That's Maybe that's the bright side. All right, welcome back to the show. I hate social media. Marcellus kind of loves it. Here to convince me it's not so terrible is our social media manager, Ball State football captain, Warren Central State champion, Sir. Darnell Smith. Mm. Awesome shirt you have on there, nice. Darnell. Ano I, I have to represent. Two. Oh, another two-star <laughs> recruit, huh? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Go Ball State. Go Ball State. <laughs> you watched the game this weekend. We almost had the number 18. Oh, I heard a word in there no, called almost. <laughs> anyway, man, let's get started with social media. It was a crazy weekend. 
Get started with Le'Veon Bell, who was in troll mode Sunday, tweeting this monocle guy emoji after the Steelers blew it and tied the Browns. You got a problem with Le'Veon trolling the Steelers? I got no problem with Le'Veon <laughs> trolling the Steelers. Exactly. Why shouldn't he? They won't give him his money. Yeah. They just lost the game without him. He just got an inch closer, maybe, to convincing them to give him money. Look, after the way his teammates went after him, Preach. this is to be expected. Yeah, I mean, through a contract negotiation, we sit on opposite ends of the table. Guess what? I don't have to be friendly to my foe. Le'Veon Bell, Le'Veon Bell sitting there like, can I live? Can I just go out? Can I go to live? Can I hang out in South Beach while you guys go out there and go play, win these games to set us up for the playoffs, and then I'll come back fresh legs. And then speaking of South Beach, I'm glad you brought that up. Mm. Um, they mentioned Saturday evening while the Steelers were preparing for the game, Guess where Le'Veon Bell was at? You know it. At a nightclub in Miami, turning up. I so. hope he was at King of Diamonds or Tootsie's <laughs> or somewhere. The That's office. where you're supposed to be Hell when yeah. you're not playing. They're not yeah. paying him to play. What was he supposed to do, sit at home and cry? It's, people don't understand, he's still in the offseason. Like, it, until you pay me, I'm still in the offseason. Yeah, I'm in Miami. Yeah, been I'm in South Beach. Prime 112, yes. around 8 o'clock. Got to set it up. King of Diamonds at 10, Tootsie's <laughs> by midnight. Uh-huh. That's a wrap. That's right. <laughs> hey, 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 look, Connor, go out there and run, big dog. I love you. I'm tired of these 300-plus carries to get the playoff, and my legs hurt a little bit. Now I'm going to have fresh legs going forward. All right, what's next, Darnell? To Dak Prescott, who took a beating from the Panthers on Sunday and also from woke Twitter, with a lot of people telling Dak to take a knee, <laughs> do you think more people will call for Dak to go full Kaepernick if he keeps struggling? Oh. Look, this is one of the thoughts that ran through my mind <laughs> yesterday when he was out there struggling. Oh, you ain't right. Dak threw some balls in the dirt, and I was like, bruh, no. <laughs> they're going to kill you on social media. <laughs> you against this national anthem yeah. protest. Yeah. And so, yeah, they all came out of the woodwork. And I, I almost, I love Dak, so I didn't do it. But I almost put up a poll, guess which week? Dak will take a knee mm. to turn the whole narrative mm. around. And yeah. if he did, if he takes a knee, then he'll yeah. be one of the best five quarterbacks in the league, according to Twitter. Right, right. Pull an Eminem, come out with a surprise album, talk about <laughs> your last performance wasn't good. You know, uh, look, he better not. This dude, not only did he say, I'm not taking a knee, he tripled down on not taking a knee. So there's no way you could do a 180 in that situation. But Dak Prescott, look, man, first of all, I love the fact that we are formally calling it woke Twitter. Like, I, I've never <laughs> heard the term that's woke Twitter. Like, that's respect. And they're coming at you. And, and if you're Dak Prescott, you just got to realize sophomore slump is in the making because of the team's construction more so than just him. All right, be careful, Darnell. I got my Twitter off here. Don't say something <laughs> stupid. All right, I'm not going to say nothing too crazy. Just mentioning that when you're a Cowboys player, you have to be prepared to, on social media, they're either going to love you or hate you. And so you got to be prepared for those shots. And even Des Bryant, I mean, he was having fun on Sunday, just yeah. taking shots at the Cowboys, responding to other tweets. So it's just something that comes with the territory. Hey, not, not a good too. look for Dez, though. Oh. That ain't quite Le'Veon Bell sitting <laughs> back over Twitter. Yeah. That ain't a good look for Dez. Yeah, Dez, stop talking about teams you want to go to. <laughs> and just sit Dez, back and let them come to you, right? That's a full-scale Twitter off for you. That man. is. And, Darnell, you preach it to the choir. Uh, I know you don't think I play for the Cowboys because a lot of people didn't see me on the field <laughs> that no much. idea. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't see you in the backfield. They saw you on the field. <laughs> you ain't lying. <laughs> true, true. Oh, All right, man. what's next, Darnell? Let's stay woke and move to Whitlock's best friend, oh, Sean King, uh. who went after struggling Bills quarterback Nate Peterman, writing that Peterman has a job and Ka Colin Kaepernick doesn't. It's white privilege. Cap supporters have been saying stuff like this for a while. Is it getting old? Uh, it's getting very old. Old? Why? Let's hear it. Come on. Oh, look, this is why I had him fill up my Twitter because I knew this was coming. I'm, I just want you to just think about this. I'm listening. Sean King is talking about white privilege. Where in America can a black man go to pretend to be white like he's getting away with being a white guy pretending to be black? Oh, man. If that ain't the epitome <laughs> of white privilege, Stop. that you get to live a double life oh. and everybody, oh, every, one what? group treats you as black, you know you're white. What? Oh, now you go in there. <laughs> boy. Oh my God. Man, look, first of all, you my boy, Sean King's my dog right there, so I gotta protect Sean King in this respect. You ain't right. We all uh, look, we all got if you oh, really want to get your dollars out. We all we get to <laughs> We all got a little of the white in us if you still in America as a, a black man. So stop going there too. Don't let the complexion fool you. Don't let the paint job fool you. Um 
I'm going to show you the picture of him with this ponytail. I'm not talking to you here. right now. I can, <laughs> there's a lot of people going around looking like Clay Curry out there, you know? A lot of light-skinned people, but they're still brothers. Um, here's the thing. He's necessary as a voice. Why? Because in the world of sports, which we say is a meritocracy, mm -hmm. but in reality, that's not objective. I've been on teams, you've been on teams. The best 11 is not on the field all the time. You can look at the business angles, contract status, PR, whatever it may be. We don't always see the best on the field. So I need a voice that's objective, that is poking at the myth of this meritocracy and saying, I just want y'all to know that Nathan Peterman is the worst quarterback in NFL okay, history. Okay, Marcellus, I completely agree Okay, with there you go. And I you just, like Sean Ford? No, 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 no. I want an informed voice on this because I think he's ill-informed and doesn't even know how to get it to really because trust me how all it takes is a, nah, a Google search nah, pro it, football reference nah, it, it, Nate Peterman it, it, bottom it, it, <laughs> it, it, it's deeper than that the kind of again when I look at the if he were focused on the issues around college athletics and college football and why so many football players are angry because they sit in that college system and get exploited okay. and get no money yeah. if that's where the animosity and energy is coming from I would get it, but this little, this is shooting fish in a barrel. This is low hanging fruit. This is some BS. Okay, but is it accurate though? No, it's not. Oh, stop I don't it. think so. I don't think so. I don't what? Think so. Darnell. Peter Mitch should be on any roster. Stop. Great job. We've run out of time here. We'll get to the next one maybe tomorrow. All right, welcome back. We're going to end our show every day with our approval ratings just to give you some context of how we come up with these. These ratings are based on four categories. Job performance in the moment, all-time great status overall, character, and authenticity. Each ranked on a scale of 0 to 25 for a total range of 0 to 100. Anything between 76 and 100 is exceptional. 66 to 75 is high. 56 to 65 is medium. 46 to 55 is low. And anything 45 and below is just really bad. Mm. Make sense? Here we go. Let's start with Aaron Rodgers. So today, we're looking at Aaron Rodgers, who led the Packers to a 17-point second-half comeback after getting carted off the field in the first half with a knee injury. But my ratings for Aaron Rodgers are virtually unchanged. I didn't really go up or down on Aaron Rodgers. Yes, you did. You went down. I, I went up. <laughs> in his all-time great status okay. a point uh -huh. because I think this is one of these magical moments that we'll remember about Aaron Rodgers for the rest of his career, him getting carted off the field, then coming back. It's Willis Reed. It's, it's uh, Michael Jordan's flu game. It's, it's Brett Favre playing on Monday night after his dad dies. Authenticity, though, I went down a point okay. because... Hmm. Getting carted off on the field, I think, was a little too much for me. That reminded me of Paul Pierce. Mm. So I have Aaron Rodgers at an overall 79. Still exceptional, except, but, you know, authenticity, I, I'm taking him down tonight. Okay, I actually got him going up uh, at 81, so overall ranking a little higher than you. Um, this is not a Willis Reed Jordan game. This is not one of those moments that were in the NBA Finals. Not week one against Mitchell Trubisky playing the Bears. Like Brett Favre on Monday Night Football is a game we talk about forever, Marcellus. And I respect that. That's why I gave him an authenticity, a legendary moment, a 23. But here are the issues. 14 in character, too many dudes, too many dudes publicly and not have said, I can't play with Aaron like that. I mean, he's amazing on the field, but Marcella. it's hard to be around. True or false? Marcel. What you got him 14 and care. I got him in 17. Not too high. <laughs> Not exceptionally high, but a 14 in character? What, because he doesn't get along with a few teammates? Well, it could translate. Look, Aaron Rodgers, most talented quarterback in NFL history, has one ring for what reasons? Because they won't give him a Khalil Mack, just like I said at the beginning of the show. If they gave him a Robin, he'd have three or four titles. God, I love setting these traps, because you walk right <laughs> in, too. So then, therefore, <laughs> let's talk about the tiers of quarterbacks in all-time history. There's tier one, Brady, Montana, correct? Yes. John Elway. Whoa, wait a minute. John, John Elway is yes. not tier one. You're too young. Go okay. Uh, too oh, young. Wait a second. That was my idol growing up. Two, tier two for me is a Peyton Manning, a Steve Young. That's tier two. Then you got tier three where 
I have an Aaron Rodgers in accomplishment. Did you at just the top list of... tier? You've thrown me off on the track. You just listed tier one and two, and I still haven't heard the name John Elway. John Elway is right there with Dan Marino and your boy Aaron Rodgers. Be real about this. In terms of all, Marino had weapons. Uh, Elway took a while to get until he got Terrell Davis for that thing to get over the hump. And we're looking at Aaron Rodgers. I'm not slighting him, but one championship for the most talented quarterback ever. Shouldn't that be regarded as a notch uh, or a, a no, negative against your resume? No, you know what we're going to do tomorrow? We're going to do an approval rating of Ted Thompson, who ran the Green Bay Packers through most of Aaron Rodgers' career. Okay. That's who needs to be graded down. Because when you're bur blessed with Aaron Rodgers, the Michael Jordan of basketball, and you can't surround him with the right pieces, the one time you gave him Charles Woodson, what did he do? He got you a Super Bowl. Wow. You're talking about something outside of Aaron Rodgers' control. If he had the teammates, He'd, he'd be right there with three or four Super Bowl titles. I'm not talking about there's an ocean divide between, between Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3. But I remember Peyton Manning not having a ton of assets, not having the offensive line that he desired, not having the defense until they get a, a Sanders of one year healthy. And Peyton Manning said, let's still keep this thing winning and rolling. And Tom Brady makes miracles out of no-namers every week. The wife Rainey wants to reach through that TV screen and slap <laughs> you right now. <laughs> hey, hey, once Reggie again, Wayne. Win-loss impact Marvin by Harrison. Sack artists. Uh, look, What was the Watson? Bob, Bob, who was oh, you, the, the, the safety? You're going to say, look, you're going to say that Aaron Rodgers. Sanders. You're going to say Aaron Rodgers hasn't had talent? Are you slighting Jordy Nelson? That. No, you, you slighting Jordy Nelson like that? Yeah, I'm slighting Jordy <laughs> Nelson. I followed his college career.